back once again the Renegade Masters or something like that. Uh, this is uh, TCGPlayer.com. I am Conley Woods. This is our Shadows over Innistrad uh, set review. Doing it via video this time, breaking down uh, not necessarily card by card, but most of the cards at least um, in uh, multiple days throughout the week. Today we'll be going over blue and black. Yesterday we tackled white uh, artifacts and lands. Uh, so if you're interested in any of those things, go check it out. Tomorrow we'll move on to green and red, and then we'll wrap up the week with double-faced cards, uh, multicolor cards, and then a look at uh, my top eight cards in the set, which shouldn't be, take as long, but uh, we'll do a little roundup with that. Um, so yeah, today we're going over blue and black, um, and the way we're kind of tackling this review this time around, uh, just to give you a quick refresher if you did not watch yesterday's video, um, is we're kind of just focusing on uh, cards to brew around, cards to build decks around, uh, cards are going to shape new standard uh, in the metagame for Tier 1 Constructed, Tier 2 Constructed, etc. Um, without much of a focus on limited too much, I'm sure I'll make some remarks here and there. Um, and, uh, and skipping over cards that are pretty much irrelevant uh, in, in Constructed. So uh, hopefully it'll be a little more helpful for the people out there looking to for ideas for decks, looking to, to know what to do in the new standard, looking for what cards to pick up, things like that. Um, as opposed to just being uh, your typical numbers uh, rating review. Uh, so with that said, let's jump into blue and black today. Um, I'm expecting a bunch of uh, madness type stuff, graveyard based stuff, uh, mill based stuff, etc. So I have a couple of cards listed, listed over here to pay attention to uh, for those purposes. So we have Murderer's Axe. Uh, these are all... Oh, I spelled this wrong. Uh, these are all cards that we've already gone over, so I just want to keep them in mind. We have Murderer's Axe, which is a Madness Enabler, so keep that in mind as we look through Madness cards. Uh, Corrupted Graphstone, which is which taps for any color mana of a card in your graveyard. Uh, so that would be important, so just pay attention to cards that enable this pretty well. John Your Temple being a graveyard uh, matters card. There's also the uh, both of the white cards that create spirits. Uh, I didn't want to loop all, lump all of those types of cards necessarily in here, but those cards also matter. John Air Temple being colorless is, I think, particularly relevant, especially uh, with Jace in the format. So we'll get to that um, uh, maybe a little bit later when we talk about some mill decks. We talked about it a little bit in the last one as well. Uh, and then also want to pay attention to clue makers uh, and things that reward you for clues because blue is one of the primary clue colors. Uh, and so we already have seen a couple of... Uh, of cards that create clues like the mana maker, uh, spine glass or magnifying glass, um, and then also uh, um, various you know trigger like the uh, the two three flyer that makes a clue whenever uh, whenever you play a creature with growth mana cost three or less. So paying paying attention to anything that rewards us for clues uh, is going to be relevant. Uh, and so like let's jump right into the set. So starting off with the cancel du jour, if you will, broken concentration here. Uh, there's a cancel in every set, it feels like. This one has a unique upside of madness, although everyone was kind of hoping for deep analysis. Or not deep analysis, excuse me. Um, uh, sir, what is the name of the card? I'm going to have to do a search, aren't I? All right. Circulating lot, or no. Not circulating logic. What am I thinking of? Circular logic. Excuse me. Uh, which I'll pull up now since I took forever to to figure out the card. All right, circular logic here, which follows the formula of being a rather uh, medium counter spell uh, if you hard cast it for three mana uh, because it's a soft counter. It's obviously worse than broken concentration for the most part uh, outside of mana restrictions in the second blue pip. Uh, so people are kind of hoping for this, where you have kind of a generic medium counter that turns into an awesome counter when you madness it, because one mana for this effect is absurd. Uh, however, if we look at broken concentration here, our madness cost actually goes up, which is interesting because we're still getting a benefit. Like, if you're discarding a card, but you're getting a spell effect out of the discard, you're essentially drawing that spell, if you think of it that way. Think about it as if you discarded any other card, and then you got this spell for free or whatever, or for, obviously you're paying a mana. But um, you are you are essentially turning that discarded resource into a spell. So it, it is card advantage. So madnessing this, if you're doing it, you know, because you want to be doing it and not because, you know, you're discarding it just to madness it. Uh, actually has some upside, so it makes some sense that the madness does cost more than the casting cost here. It's also easier to cast, which is relevant. Um, however, I don't think this is going to be nearly 
the player that Circular Logic it was. Circular Logic was a constructed all star. Uh, it paired very, very well with cards like Wild Mongrels. You could just play it on turn three, and then it'd be protected with the Circular Logic on turn four. Broken Concentration does not give you that option. Uh, Broken Concentration maybe is a decent card to like discard to a fast looter or uh, or you know something like Thirst for Knowledge style card um, because you can mana and get some value. But that you're really talking about late game kind of situations there when you have a lot of mana. So I think this card will be a player. Um, I'm sure it'll see some amount of constructive play, but I don't think it's going to be. Uh, heavily played. It'll basically only be played in decks with a lot of discard options. Not like, like if you have, you know, four to eight discard options in your deck, I highly doubt you're going to be able to spring for a Broken Concentration or at least many copies of them. Maybe you fit one or two in your deck. Um, but yeah, it's just not, neither side is so powerful that it's like a must run. Uh, that said, you know, it is, it's a solid enough card. I'm sure we'll see play. Not really worth building around. Uh, Catalog here. Uh, I was talking about thirst for knowledge. Here's the the much worse thirst for knowledge, uh, both in terms of art. What is going on in this art here? We got why why is she cataloging? I don't, wait. That's just that's Tamio, and she's I don't know what's going on here. I thought this was like a scythe, and there's the moon in the back, which makes sense. I don't know. I don't really get it. But anyway, uh, she she's uh, you discard two, you draw two cards. You discard card three mana instant speed. You really need to be desperate for Madness Enablers or something weird for this uh, reanimator deck. I mean, it's very, very fringe playable, although I would avoid it. Uh, next card is also fringe playable because of its claws, but it is an awesome card. So, there are not many zombies currently in standard, but there are some amount. Uh, keep in mind, this is not actually standard we're looking at. These are, are the current standard, at least. Uh, as, well, I guess as you see this, it's pre-release weekend. So, so yeah, it's, it's not current standard, but it is standard as of... Shadows over Innistrad, minus Shadows over Innistrad, because that is not on Magic Online. So this is Corset, uh, which is Magic Origins. Um, I guess it's not a Corset anymore, but you know what I mean. Uh, the Dragons of Tarkir, uh, Battle for Zendikar, and Oath of the Gatewatch. Uh, so that's those four sets, and these are the zombies uh, within the... Okay, we just got to scab right? So I was dragging that one here. These are the only expensive one, yeah. So these are the zombies within that set that I that I pulled out that I thought were relevant at least. Uh, you have like random small stuff like the goblin and shambling ghoul and stuff. And we're going to see these come up time and time again because there's going to be a bit of a zombie theme across the two color today because they are blue and black. Um, and luckily all the zombies that we have are blue and black, so that makes sense. Uh, compelling deterrence uh, specifically is a very, very strong card assuming you're willing to go zombies. Uh, so if two mana to return target not land permanent to its owner's hand, that's fine. It's playable. It's not great. Uh, you would probably not run that if you're in constructed unless you were really, really hurting for the, an effect of that nature, and it was the only kind in the format. Uh, but then the the next ability, they discard a card if you control zombie, turns this into card advantage ish. It, it replaces itself, I guess. Uh, but more importantly, is it turns into a vindicate when your opponent is empty handed. So if you are playing any type of discard strategy or wait for them to get their hand empty, or they're discarding cards themselves to madness or filter graveyard or whatnot, uh, then eventually. Unlike most bounce spells and or discard spells, which kind of lose their value later on as the game goes on, bounce spells because the opponent has an empty hand and can just recast that thing without um, and worrying about it the following turn. Like, they don't have to, like, be like, oh, do I choose to recast that spell or cast these other two spells? They just get to do everything because they have enough mana. And discard obviously gets weaker because your opponent just doesn't have a hand. So, you know, they don't have anything to discard. This card actually gets stronger as the as the game goes on because uh, eventually it turns into a two mana vindicated in instant speed I guess in non land permanent but you know what I'm saying uh, and and before that even if you know you're bouncing something and your opponent has two or three cards in hand unless one of them is a throwaway land they're still faced with a kind of tough decision uh, whereas early on in the game if you make them bounce it they're probably going to discard a random land or an expensive spell they might be able to cast whatever um, so this has this has a kind of a different feel than those other uh, style effects despite combining them together. Now, as I was mentioning, uh, these are some of the zombies, or these are most of the zombies and zombie rewards we have in the format. And there are actually quite a few of them. Uh, stuff like Shambling Ghoul, 2 mana 2 3 does not seem, you know, super awesome, but it that's perfectly playable. It survives Kozilek's Return, uh, survives big sweepers like that. Uh, so stuff like this that you haven't even probably thought of, uh, all of a sudden might become playable in the format just because it's cheap and a zombie, and in this case it has a relevant body. Uh, there's also other incentives like Risen Executioner here that we're going to get to uh, later, and, and I'm not going to skip over this too much because 
Uh, we're going to come back and talk to it a bunch about 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 it a bunch later on. So don't worry if I don't talk about any particular zombie right now. Uh, but like Risen Executioner's in the format, people don't really play him, and if you do play him, you play him for his reanimation clause. But in a zombie deck, you know he's a four mana four three lord, which is not that bad. Uh, it's an interesting card at least, and it does come back from your graveyard if you happen to have an empty graveyard. So uh, we'll get to more zombie stuff later. Compelling de deterrence, pretty awesome card. Uh, one of my favorite bounce spells I've seen in a long time. You're probably you're never gonna run this in a deck with like less than I would say eight zombies probably. Uh, eight zombies being very really low. You're most likely to only want to play this in heavy zombie decks, uh, but it is still sweet. Also, the flavor text is awesome. All right, so we get to our second counter spell in like four cards. Uh, confirm suspicions. I don't know what I feel about this card. We have, it's five mana counter spell. Investigate three times, and that is I don't know. I don't know because on the one hand, if you replace investigate three times with draw three cards, this card is unprintably strong. I assume. I assume that's just like you know, draw three cards, counter target spell is just. It, I imagine it's way too good. It's different than, than most draw cards. It's got some downsides where you just can't fire it off at will. But it seems too strong. This is different, obviously. You have to pay six additional mana to get those cards. But you also, again, we, we're going to pay attention to clue makers uh, because you know we might get enough of them for that deck to be a thing. I don't think so, but I just want to pay attention to it. So uh, Confirmed Suspicion certainly does that. Three uh, clues right away is quite a bit and quite a lot if you have something triggering off clues coming into play, for example. So I want to pay attention to this card. Uh, I assume it's too bad to run in constructed in heavy numbers. If you're going to run it, it's going to be like a one of or two of uh, as a counter spell that has card advantage on it. 11 mana to counter a spell and draw three cards is probably not good enough, but you get to space that out so much that you know maybe it is good enough. 5 mana up front is a pretty clunky counter spell cost, I'm not going to lie. Uh, so you can't really run like more than like two of these, I would imagine. And most decks, I I would imagine, can't run any of them just because five mana is, I don't know. You're just you you can't use that as your primary counter spell. You can't deal with things you want to deal with. Five mana is in the range of like I just need to counter whatever I can counter with this because if I don't cast it on my opponent's turn after you open five mana, I've hurt myself so much. Like you just you, you lose so much advantage there. Five, losing five mana through a turn cycle to do nothing is just terrible. So this has some real risks to it, and that's why I worry about it being a constructed card. That said, uh, there are potential niche, niche decks where it's good, and you know, like your control deck might just want a random draw three attached to their counter spell, and like this does do that. Uh, especially if we get any super grindy blue black control decks, which we very very well might. Uh, so interesting card. Although I just am not sold on the rate. If it was like four mana up front, uh, I think that would be a lot more attractive. Five mana is just a little risky, I think. Uh, deny existence, remove soul for three mana that exiles the card. Probably playable, uh, but not great. I, I like the idea that I'm playing the two mana one that counters a creature of career might cost four or less. Uh, I've been playing that because it's devoid and it exiles things. So like this is potentially playable in that same space. Very, very uh, fringe. You're going to run like one or two copies of this probably uh, in addition to horribly awry or something along those lines. Alright, another investigate card. This one's just a uh, common for a limited. We're not going to worry about it, but it does investigate. Four mana, two, four. Alright, now our second... So, so far we've <laughs> covered two counter spells in two zombie uh, build around. So as you can see, we're coming back to zombies. This guy's kind of kind of neat. So he's a four mana, one, one zombie by himself that brings a second body to the play, which is not something most tribal decks get. They don't get, like, two body cards. Like, Elves Occasion gets, like, a one, one token with itself, and Goblins Occasion gets a one, one token. But this just, like, plays quite differently, I think. Uh, oh, the, the zombie does not come to pick tapped. I thought it did. Okay, so you get two untapped bodies, even. Um, the, the, claw, the Death Touch Clause on this is awesome outside of the cost itself. Like, if that cost black, I think it would be... This would be, like, constructed... Not all-star, but it would be, you know, one of the better cards in the zombie deck, maybe. Uh, important for, like, beating up all the mid-range creature decks, which I suspect there'll be a decent number of. Uh, but as is, at three mana, that's just, like... You're, it's kind of a bluff, almost... Like, you just need to attack into creatures and never actually use it. You just need to basically show that you can use it, just because it's it's so expensive to use. Uh, in Constructed, taking three mana to give something Death Touch is just, you know, not the greatest exchange, especially if you're playing an aggro zombie deck. 
Um, so a, the reason you're going to play this card, though, is mostly because it's two zombie bodies in one card. Uh, and when you're playing with cards like Risen Executioner, um, like Kalidus, is Kalidus be able to sack zombies? No, you put zombies in a... Oh, yeah, you can. You can sack another zombie or vampire. Uh, so with stuff like Kalidus, we have two bodies just straight out of the gates we could sacrifice. And granted, these two bodies are not necessarily the greatest rate. We're going to get to better rate cards later on that give you four power toughness or even more. Uh, this only gives you three power toughness, but it does bring this little extra ability along. Uh, so I just wanted to mention it. I don't think he's like great or anything like that, uh, but he's playable. So keep him in mind. We also got Undead Server, which I'm pretty excited is, is in the format that nobody's played in forever. I think this card is quite strong. Uh, you just needed more incentives to run him. And once zombies are a thing, I think he becomes a thing. All right, Engulf the Shore. This is one of my favorite cards in the set. Uh, check this out. Number of islands you control. Bam. This was one of my favorite cards in... Theros or whatever, I think it's it's one of the, it's that in Theros set. Uh, and I don't know why I love this guy. I guess the idea of him just being a win condition that buys you time, returns everything, and you can also get, take advantage of that returning of everything. Like you could, um, you know, all your cards with, comes into play effects, you get to re-trigger. All of your uh, planeswalkers, you get to reset the counters on if that's relevant. You get to just do weird things like that. Uh, and the idea was really cool to me. The downside of this guy was that he's seven mana. So you just, he can't be defense number one. He can't be defense number two. He's like tertiary or, you know, whatever, way down the line. Like, I have one or two of these in my deck and I play it to, like, seal the game. And unfortunately, Cyclonic Rift kind of basically did all of what this guy wanted to do and more. Uh, so this Scourge of Fleet just never saw play. Engulf the Shore, on the other hand, is four mana and an instant, which are two gigantic upgrades. Obviously, we're losing a 6 6 body, so we can't play this as a win condition anymore. But four mana, including just being a single blue, and, well, I mean, that's, you know, kind of less important because of. Of the claws, but uh, and and being an instant are both huge. You get to, uh, I mean, I guess this technically I shouldn't I shouldn't say it's restricted. Oh no, this only hit creatures too. I was gonna say this hit non land permanents. So this this only hit. Uh, I don't know why I was thinking this hit. Okay, so these are actually just the exact same text box uh, in terms of bouncing uh, creatures. This one hit creatures your opponents controlled. And this one is all creatures. But let's assume you're playing this in the control deck where you're not really bouncing your things. For some reason, I thought this also bounced your permanents. Uh, I never actually got to play with this. We, tr we tried playing this in the Pro Tour many times. I think there's three, two, three, three, three Pro Tours in a row. We had a deck with this in it. Uh, but we never actually played with it. Uh, but we were trying the Mono Island decks. And for some reason, I remember this bouncing permanents. But it doesn't. Uh, Engulf the Shore bounces only creatures, which is kind of the important part, though. So... We'll get back to Engulf the Shore off my tangent on Scourge of Fleets. Uh, the Bouncing Creatures um, is something that Blue doesn't necessarily get anymore. Like Evacuation is a card, you know, they obviously get single target bounce spells. But in terms of board reset, Blue does not really get that at efficient rates anymore. It does get Cyclonic Rift at 7 mana, sure. It gets like things like that, like multi-kicker type feeling cards that are really expensive. But there's really hasn't been like a... Three or four mana, bounce all your stuff, reset the board by time in a while. Uh, Hercules Recall is like the last one in ninth or 10th edition or something, and that only hits artifacts. Uh, but yeah, that kind of stuff just doesn't see print too often. And for good reason. It's It can it gives blue something that blue doesn't typically have, which is kind of uh, a way of fighting aggressive creature decks. Uh, obviously kills token strategies just outright. It just buys you a lot of time and tempo on turn four or earlier if you can you know ramp uh, that then gets you to the part of the game where blue is good at where which is where you have mana at your disposal and you can draw cards you can counter spells you can cast multiple things in a turn uh, and so engulf the shore does that in kind of an elegant way where I even get to protect against uh, haste because of the instant speed ability um, and I get to bounce pretty much anything if I'm playing mono blue four islands in play on turn four casting this up pretty much gonna bounce everything uh, there might be one or two exceptions but there's no siege rhino anymore that I have to worry about that just randomly has an extra point of toughness uh, so for the most part you're gonna bounce everything and if you don't you can wait an extra turn uh, but just being able to, to gain that huge amount of tempo and encounter things on the way back down or maybe make your opponent discard their hand with some effect 
uh, whatever combination you want to do. The point is that Engulf the Shore just enables a blue deck, uh, specifically a mono blue or heavy blue deck, to do something that it otherwise could never do. Um, so, you know, is this enough incentive to be mono blue? Uh, probably not by itself, but there might be some other stuff out there. Heavy blue mana costs, uh, other things that count islands. I don't even know what's in there. Let me see. Uh, let's do a quick... Quick uh, search. I'm just going to type in island, and we're going to see. It's not going to be exactly accurate. We can obviously uh, we can refine. Okay, there's not many, but there is Guardian of Tazim. I don't think he's good enough, but he's just on the border of probably being good enough. He's got five toughness, so you can potentially not bounce him with the Gulf to Shore on turn five. Uh, but if you do play an island, you get to lock down a creature, which kind of co combos this in some elegant way. Where you like reset all the creatures and then you lock down the one every turn afterwards. Uh, that said, that is probably not enough incentive by itself, so we'll pay attention to the rest of the blue cards as we go along. But I'm a fan. Go off the shore, pick it up, do your thing. All right, let's talk about Piffany at the John here because it's an interesting card that I am not uh, sold on, but it is an interesting card. So X blue, and we basically uh, factor fiction. Uh, we separate our the two piles that we get or the cards into two piles and then our opponent chooses one of those piles and puts in your hand alone in your graveyard. So if you spend four man on this, I'm comparing it to factor fiction at this point, if you spend four man on this, you take the top three cards of your deck, separate them into two piles, your opponent chooses one of those piles, and you get that pile. Um, so it is no three cards compared to five cards factor fiction, not even remotely close because it re re resolves you getting one card way more often, significantly more often, and often that one card is, uh, you know, it's not as good because it came out of a pile of three cards, so you just didn't have as much card quality, as much card selection, as long, big of a range when you were looking at it. That said, factor fiction could never look at. 10 cards, you can never look at 6 cards, you can never look at 7 cards, etc. Epiphany of the Drowner does offer you that ability. In the late game, when you have a bunch of mana, if you sink 6 or 7 mana into this, you can see a lot of cards, and you be, and not just are you seeing those cards, but the more cards you see translate to the more cards go in your hand. Not on a 1 to 1 basis, it's basically roughly half of X. So if I'm spending 7 mana on this, I'm roughly going to draw 4 cards, or uh, yeah, roughly 4 cards, maybe 3 cards, depending on the piles. Uh, but you know you're getting you're getting roughly half of the mana you're spending on this. So eight mana is going to get you three or four cards. Uh, Ten mana is going to get you four or five cards, etc. Uh, so it does go up, uh, except you know it goes up essentially two x or half x. Um, so it's not like a card that you like should be seeking out ways to generate tons of mana to cast a pivot and a drown yard for a million because you know it doesn't it's not that valuable. On the other hand, it is valuable if you care what's going to your graveyard. So once again, uh, we're gonna pull up a little graveyard stuff here if I ever come on back to my mind. I know you got it in there. There you go. Alright, so these are cards that care about uh, the graveyard that are currently in standard. We got some over here. We got things like a Jutai's Command, which is blue. I'm gonna look at blue cards real quick first, just because they're here. Uh, Living Lore is kind of an interesting one. It doesn't work with Epiphany because Epiphany's got an X on his casting cost, but it's still an interesting card to get cards in your graveyard for. Uh, Tide Caller, if you're happy to be playing with uh, um, Awaken cards, I don't, I doubt that. But obviously, Jace is a big reason to get cards in your graveyard. I'm not sure if Disciple of the Ring is strong enough, but it's an interesting set of abilities that you know, if the format dumbs down a little bit in green white little kid kind of becomes the deck of choice. This is maybe a strong enough card against that uh, because, you know, one mana tapped on a creature is pretty strong. One mana just to have a reasonable threat is pretty strong. Um, but then you have, you know, a bunch of, like, return multiple permanents. You have Zombifies. There's a double Zombify that we're going to get to later on in the in the set review today. Uh, there's Corpse Weft, which makes zombies and cares about having a bunch of cards in your graveyard because you want to exile creatures. There's this dude who I think has been tragically underplayed uh, a three mana one for death touch is like borderline playable as is I mean it's not that it's not like great but it is does something it blocks pretty well against aggressive decks and it deals with a big threat later on but then its other line of text like theoretically this is you know six seven eight nine ten power 
uh, if you if you're dealing a bunch of life loss via having creatures in your graveyard. So like this is a really interesting card when we start filling up a graveyard with things like Epiphany at the drawing yard. Um, I think Epiphany itself is not the greatest rate, so you're not going to be able to justify it unless you're getting additional benefits beyond just the drawing of the cards. Um, but you know, it's not Sphinx's Revelation, but it is a fast, instant, speed uh, draw spell that draws you more cards the later in the game. So I'm sure we'll see some amount of play. But it's a really interesting one to think about for graveyard decks. Uh, all right, I think I spent enough time on this card. It's Factor Fiction is such an interesting card to like wrap your head around. Uh, so adding an X cost to it is interesting. The only problem is when this card starts getting really juicy, it just costs so much mana. Uh, but yeah, it's you can always pay one by the way, um, uh, one for X. And if you do that, you're going to put one card in one pile and zero cards in the other pile. So your opponent's going to give you zero cards. So at that point, you're just going to mill one. So you need to at least invest three mana in this to get back your first card. So keep that in mind. Don't waste it. I mean, I guess if you really want to mill one, you could spend two mana. Do your thing. Um, Erd Wall Illuminator, who's got sweet art. And he's flying around with his little lantern. He's a one three two mana one three flyer. Already already I'm like on board. That's like my stats right there. I'm down for some two mana one three flyers, you know. Uh, it's a spirit, which is gonna be relevant. We already looked at the white guy that bounces spirits. We know spirits are like a pseudo relevant uh, tribe. Uh, I I did some searching for spirits, uh, and they're not as many as you would think. There's like five in, in standard right now. There you go. These are the these are the standard spirits. Now there is a really good one here in Anafenza, but we'll get back to that when we get to more spirit matter stuff. Uh, this guy is a spirit though, and when you investigate investigate for the first time each turn, you investigate an additional time. So this thing is one of those cards that cares about investigating. He does not care about you investigating a lot, as in the the five mana counter spell make three uh, clues because that. Um, is you know a lot that's a lot of clues at once you don't you only get paid off for the first clue granted this guy does pay you off for playing with instant speed investigate because he does trigger on both turns so if I if I investigate on my turn I get another clue and if I investigate on my opponent's turn I get another clue but he doesn't pay me for those two extra clues that come off of the spell so maybe he's not the best with that particular card but at least he is a he's an interesting card to he's our kind of first uh, clue matters card that pays you in clues, so we need another clue that matters card, but this guy's at least worth, uh, worth jotting down. I got no deck for him, though. He doesn't, he's, he's deckless. Alright, Essence Flux. Uh, it blinks something. It's cloud. So this is, uh, what's the name of the cloud? Cloud Shift? I think it's Cloud Shift. I want to say it's Cloud Shift. Mm -mm. You so smart. All right, so uh, yeah, it's cloud shift. Except it has the extra bonus clause of if it's a spirit, you get a plus one plus one counter ride. So that is sweet, and that makes this card pretty good. I think cloud shift is borderline playable. I think essence flux is borderline playable if you're trying to get a momentary blink style deck. Um, I have all these creatures I pulled out for the eerie interlude deck work with essence flux, so I don't need to pull them up again. I'm just gonna combine them because. Wait, did it just... Oh, okay. So you can see them all on Uno page. Um, so there's like a lot of cool creatures here already that aren't... Thank you, Facebook, for being obnoxious. Uh, there's a lot of cool creatures here already. I haven't really looked at what uh, is spirits because according to uh, my spirit search, only Tower Geist would have been... Uh, I, guess, I guess technically... And the Fenza triggers this. So, and the Fenza does work with this, which is kind of nice. But you also have interesting stuff like Harbinger of the Tides, which is not a spirit, but is something you would definitely like to blink occasionally. Uh, maybe you get really bold and you run the Fairy Miscreant deck. I doubt it, but you know, there's it, it exists. You can you can try that. You can get some more tokens off your Whirler Rogue, your Drowner of Hopes. Uh, you can trigger your Profaner of the Deads, which is another card that bounces creatures with low toughness to people's hands. It's kind of a weird set of abilities we're getting. This guy's kind of an interesting card to blink. There's, but my point is that there's a bunch of stuff that you probably have not looked at that is 
arguably borderline playable. For example, like Harbinger of the Tides. This card is definitely constructed playable. I will you bet everything on it. It just has not seen much play because it has not really had a home. Uh, so maybe if you're playing with Essence Flux and you're playing with Eerie Interlude, uh, maybe it does. So just keep that guy in mind. This, and by that guy, I mean Essence Flux, which is not only not a guy, it is probably a girl on an instant. So <laughs> I'll do a better job of that. All right, we got we got a new Investigate card. Uh, so this one is our first payoff for doing stuff with our clues. Uh, so whenever it enters the battlefield, you get a clue. Great. And then whenever you sacrifice a clue, so I have to spend my mana, but when you do sacrifice a clue, target player mills three. Now, that can be used offensively. Obviously, I could be milling myself to set up some type of reanimate, to set up my delirium, to set up, I don't know, whatever the heck you want to be doing. Or, I can start going at my opponent's deck, which brings risks. Now, granted, there's no more delves, so you don't have that risk, but you have the risk of your opponent using their graveyard for delirium, your opponent using your graveyard for reanimate, your opponent using your graveyard for their graveyard for jace. All the same things you're going to be doing, your opponent can do that too. Uh, however, it does, if I store up clues, let's say I have four or five clues sitting in play when I cast this, I get a six clue, and then later on in the game, I can just go, end of your turn, I'm going to draw four cards, mill you for 12. Untap, draw four cards, mill you for 12, game over. And like that is a lethal way to beat control. Um, I don't know if that is good enough, but that's what I'm offering you. You got, you got, you got that deck, and basically that's it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna note the. Uh, kind of want to separate these guys. There we go. This is not my favorite uh, clue payoff, but it is our first like true payoff. So it's our first payoff that doesn't need, doesn't just make more clues. <laughs> Uh, this guy is an interesting, like, I, I know I've been saying interesting a bunch, I realize that, but this guy's actually just legitimately interesting. When new, when new Psych comes out, I find a lot of cards interesting, actually. Um, this card's got Skulk, and it's a 3-3 three, three for 4, so it's, Skulk is not as relevant as other Skulk cards, but it's still not going to be blocked by, you know, uh, I don't what, I'm trying to think of a 4-power creature. I was going to say Cletus, but Cletus has 3-power. Oh, it can't be blocked by Goblin Dark Dwellers, he's right here, rocking out. That's a relevant one. Uh, but yeah, it can't be blocked by bigger guys, which is, you know, fine. But its ability doesn't even really care too much about that. Like, you, you're you playing this guy because of his ability. You're not playing him because of Skulk. Skulk's kind of like a bonus keyword thrown on because they're like, hey, we need more creatures to Skulk at rare. Um, but at the beginning of your upkeep, you may discard all the cards in your hand if you do draw that many cards. This effect is Bononkers. It's Bananas plus Bonkers combined. <laughs> we got, it's Bononkers. Uh... Because of Madness, specifically, because of how quickly you get to go through your deck to find a specific card, because of how quickly you get to fill up your graveyard for Delirium, because of how quickly you get to fill up your graveyard for shenanigans like gra uh, like Reanimates. It just does all kinds of things, and it doesn't give you card disadvantage. You don't lose a card. You're discarding your hand, uh, and then you're drawing that many cards, so you're really just filtering. And every Madness card you cast is just straight-up card advantage, because it's like you drew that spell extra. Uh, you should have all your mana available because it's the beginning of your turn. This card just, he, he, he is really interesting. He offers a lot of cool little trinket sort of things to do. None of them necessarily fit into the shell of a traditional deck. Like, you're not going to be like, throw this guy in my blue, black, and deck, and, he's, and it's good to go. You really need to either build around him or put him in decks with lots of synergy naturally, that like Madness decks, where you just want this type of effect. Uh, but assuming you're able to do that, assuming you're able to like go the extra mile and make this thing good, it is it does some awesome things. Like It, it can be a very, very powerful card in a very kind of simple, non-threatening looking body. Uh, the fact that it's also a 3-3 and like attacks Planeswalkers and stuff is nice, um, but you're mostly interested in abusing that uh, triggered ability and abusing it often. So do that. Yeah. I'm glad there's a homunculus in the set. That's all I gotta say there. Alright, Geralt's Masterpiece. He's a Masterpiece. Uh, he's another cares about, or he's another Madness enabler, uh, and he works from your graveyard, which is huge. Four mana, discard three cards. Get a guy tapped at instant speed, which is nice. Um, and he's gonna be small. He's gonna, he's gonna be probably let's. Well, after that ability, he won't be small. He'll probably be a six six or seven seven. But if you were to cast him on turn five, he'd probably be a four four or five five. But that is perfectly fine for your your 
five mana, uh, and he can block when you do cast him from your hand. Later on, when you're discarding cards to cast him, that is kind of like you're turning your extra lands, you're turning your extra draw spells, and you know things like that into this guy again. So that's more of like I'm a control deck, and I'm battling against another control deck, and I needed to have my win condition multiple times. Where this guy fails is that unlike a lot of win conditions, like your Jutai's and your Dragon Lord Silmgars and stuff like that, is this guy doesn't provide you really any immediate impact on the board outside just being a body. He doesn't ste he doesn't like kill a creature, he doesn't steal something, he doesn't draw you cards. Um, so because of that, even though he does kind of win uh, control mirrors, he's sort of like a Pearl Ink Ancient, which I'll pull up in case you don't know what that is. Uh, which looked like an awesome card and, and because it beats control to 7 mana, 6, 7, flash, can't be countered, prowess, return 3 lands your hand, and you save it. Like, all those abilities are awesome, and it is great against control, but the truth was this guy just never, or very rarely got included in decks because you couldn't afford to run a a giant body that was only good against control decks. You needed your win condition to also be good against aggro, to also have card advantage, to also impact the board, etc., etc. And so things like Dragon Lord Jutai and Dragon Lord Silmgar, which just had immediate board impact, or had, um, in the case of a Jutai, it had Hexproof, which made it good against control, but then it had card advantage, which made it just good as a card in, in general. Uh, things like Pearl Link Agent and Gerald's Masterpiece, they just don't offer enough, uh, so it's difficult to justify them. That said, Gerald's Masterpiece might go in a completely different deck, Maybe it's it is a zombie if you notice. So maybe it just goes in the zombie deck. Maybe it goes in like the top cur of the curve of some weird graveyard mill deck. There's a lot of things to be doing here. The card's pretty sweet. It has a lot of uh, of avenues to explore. It just d doesn't offer the the true control win condition properties that I think we're looking for. Uh, Ghostly Wings is a neat card, although it's highly unlikely to be playable. Uh, gone missing, five mana, blah, blue, blue, blue. Invasive surgery. So if you like, uh, if you like dispel, and you like extirpate, have I got a have I got a card for you, my friend? Uh, you see, we have this card where the person's cutting open this other person's brain and is way too happy about it. Like this. If, you, if anyone's face ever looks like this when they're cutting open your brain, you are screwed. You're, you're done for. Uh, but yeah, so this counters sorcery, which uh, actually mirrors Dispel. Dispel obviously counters instant. Um, so it's kind of nice that both those are in the format at once. So that one blue mana now uh, represents countering either mode. Is Dispel still in the... I think it's in the form right after rotation. I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, but now one blue mana. You can't be sure whether your instants or sorceries are safe. Also, we already have a counter target non-creature spell since controller pays one in that slot. So one blue mana becomes a lot scarier in the new world. There's just all kinds of stuff that you kind of have to, to worry about. Actually, that, that card has ferocity. It might be rotating. Let me... Uh, what is the name of that card? I have it in my... Got it in my Demir Drowsy deck. I think. No, I don't. Where do I have it? Home seat. Go deep. Down. Click. Click. Oh, no. Magic on my. Thank you. Stubborn Denial. Stubborn Denial gone. Uh, I don't actually know what set this is. How can you tell? Did that tell me? No. I, did, I don't know what set. I don't know the set things that well anymore because all right. Well, you you guys all know at home. You fill in the gaps. Uh, here I'll say, uh, this this rotates. This doesn't rotate. All right. Now they'll edit. They'll edit that. Whichever one's correct is the thing I'll say. The rest of this you won't hear. We'll move on. With <laughs> My point was the one blue is awesome in new standard. If for nothing else, it has to spell an invasive surgery. Um, Counter a sorcery spell is fine. The delirium here is super relevant, of course, uh, as you're exiling um, a bunch of cards, uh, including cards that are already in the graveyard. So you're going to reduce your opponent's. Uh, is that correct? The next exile. So yeah, you're going to reduce your opponent's delirium. You're going to potentially uh, get card advantage out of your opponent by taking a card out of their hand, which is you know crazy good. Um, and you're also weakening their late game if you like counter. 
uh, a key sorcery that it, that's needed for their uh, you know win condition or whatever. This is not a very main deckable card, as you know some decks won't even have won't have a single sorcery in them. But uh, other decks are going to be playing painful truths and stuff like that. Painful truths alone is enough reason to probably run this. Uh, there's also ruinous path and there's all kinds of stuff. Ooh, we got a Bladeswalker! Alright, we got a Jace. Is anybody else a little sick and tired of Jace? Just a little bit? Like, all the other colors, it's got like three to four kind of cool Planeswalkers. Blue has Tamio, who's not even in... She's like, she, she's all over the cards, and she's not even in the set. We just get another Jace. This is like Jace number 17. Like, we used to call Jace's by one, two, three. Jace one was awesome. Jace two was awesome. Jace three was awesome. And now we're on like Jace... This is nine? I don't even know. I'm just done with Jace. Jace is, you know, I'm just going to act like this is someone else. This is Race, Unraveler of Secrets. Uh, and Race has plus one scry draw card. Pretty strong. Minus two to bounce a card. And then Race has this, uh, what's this last? Oh, Arayo. So anybody that doesn't know Arayo, you should probably know Arayo. But... Oh, I got to I gotta have, have zero Arayo. Um, so Ryo is uh, when it flips, it becomes the the, the ultimate of race here. <laughs> Whenever an opponent casts their first spell each turn, counter that spell. Whenever an opponent casts their first spell each turn, counter that spell, etc. So the ultimate here is very winnable through, but you don't really look at Planeswalkers. The ultimate, what race really has going on is that it protects itself with the bounce ability. It could use it a couple times even. Scrying one and then drawing a card is very strong. I'm quite surprised that this doesn't investigate. I believe, given the story, that Jace is actually, like, all he's doing is running around investigating. So I'm kind of bummed that they didn't make this plus one, like, either scry one investigate or investigate draw a card, which is kind of draw two in the future. Like, one of those two abilities, I think, would just have been so much cooler flavor-wise. But scry one, draw a card, you know, whatever. It's around. Uh, I think this guy is, this race is, uh... <laughs> I, I, said, I, I went back and, and mentioned how he, he's running around as Jace looking at secrets. We're going to call him Race again. I feel like my, my cover-up was not working out as well as I would like. Uh, but So basically, I kind of view this sort of as Obnixilis, um, which is to say... Oh, actually, I have an Obnixilis in the Allies deck. Allies. It's sort of like Obnixilis, almost exactly. Five mana, five loyalty. Plus one ability, you're drawing a card. Minus three ability, or the minus ability, you're dealing with a, a creature. Obviously, in a one world, you're dealing with it less permanently, but you are spending less loyalty. And then, uh, target opponent gets an emblem. That thing is, I would, I would say, both uh, ultimates at minus eight are like pretty much the same. Like Jace's is like likely to win, but certainly not unbeatable. Omnixus's is likely to win, but certainly not unbeatable. Like taking four damage a turn is not, you're not dead. Uh, and neither are you if you first spells can encounter. So, like, these cards are, like, remarkably similar. Uh, the big difference being that Obnixilis is black and Jace is blue, so Jace will probably see a little bit more play as a result of that. That said, other Jace is going to be around, and there's going to be some amount of fighting uh, off of not being able to have two Jaces in play. Um, so, I don't know. I think Obnixilis will certainly see more play in the new world as well. So, it's not like I'm saying Obnixilis is bad. I think Obnixilis is a strong card. I just, he just hasn't found really a home where he's like a two of or a three of very often. He's often just like a, a singleton in a deck doing some stuff. And I think Jace, this Jace at least, Unraveler Secrets, is going to do that quite often, especially just because two mana Jace is running around and people are going to play him as a four of. And, you know, playing four of that Jace and two or three of this Jace is just really risky. Uh, because you just get Jace flooded. That said, uh, playable card for sure. Pick it up, do your thing. Let's not reduce opponent's power or creature's power by two. That's or by four. That's not good. I kind of like just the wind. Uh, I don't like it nearly as much as the zombie bounce spell that makes people discard. But I like the idea of a madness uh bounce thing here. I mean, small effect. Obviously, it's going to go in very very few decks. But it's it is a niche playable card that I like a lot. Uh, and also it's just kind of cool flavor. I just like the idea. Innistrad just gets to do all kinds of cool flavor. Another zombie, this one, you get to draw a card and discard a card if you control another zombie, but it's 5 mana 3 5, so, meh. Manic Scribe. Uh, so this guy's cool. Mills and each opponent, so you can't target yourself, which is important because you can't set up, uh, her own delirium 
with her mill. So the uh, first ability, you know, mills your opponent for three, so you need to be playing that kind of deck, you need to be playing a mill deck, but you also get a two mana zero three, which is just buff playable for dealing with uh, aggressive decks from the opponent. Uh, if we go to look at mill, obviously most of the mill from uh, in standard or in the new standard is going to be coming from the new set, but there is a few mill cards. Uh, this one that only hits you, but that I guess works with it. Um, Ozu Jace works. This kind of works. Dreadwater hits any player. It hits for the number of lands you control, but that could could be quite strong. Uh, so this is an interesting card to continue to think about in the future. This mills yourself and return the creature, so you can use it with your Manic Scribe. You can mill your Manic Scribe, pick it up, do that. It's kind of interesting. And then there's stuff like Evolutionary Leap, which is pretty good with Manic Scribe for obvious reasons. Oath of Nissa, which is kind of good with it, um, as it also is a is an enchantment that's legendary, so you can get two enchantments in your yard pretty easily. Same with Oath of Jace in that regard. Uh, Gather the pack. There's like all kinds of cool ways to get... Delirium for your Manic Scribe, and to potentially be milling your opponent. So, I don't want to write this guy off. He's, he's, or she, I guess. I'm pretty sure it's a girl. I can't tell. The, the, look, art looks no, close enough to a girl. I'm going to call her a girl. She, um, I, she is, you know, borderline playable in the right deck. So, I think that right deck probably won't exist until Shadows of Randestrad is, or the next set comes out, and we have a full block of cards that matter about mill. But, I don't know, pretty cool little card, at least. Uh, nagging thoughts. If this were an instant, it would probably be really strong. As a sorcery, I don't think it'll see too much play. It's essentially a uh, sleight of hand. Um, you sleight of hand reads like this, I think, right? Obviously, it goes the other one goes to the bottom of your deck, not your graveyard. Look, top your card to library, put in your hand in the bottom of your library. So we're spending a full additional mana for sleight of hand here and getting the upside of madness. I just don't think that's great. Uh, maybe it sees a little bit of play in modern or something weird to discard a faithless rebooting. Like, that's possible. But uh, I assume it will not see a ton of play in constructed standard. Uh, anticipate still around, which just seems better to me for most purposes. Um, Moondrakes. This is not my favorite card and not really super constructed playable. If you're going to play this in constructed, it's because you're spending six mana to give all your creatures flying. I j that doesn't seem like a very highly playable constructed ability to me. Flying, if it matters, it usually matters on a single creature. It's not like you have a bunch of guys that are trying to soar over a bunch of opposing guys. Like That's a really strange matchup where you're a blue deck and you have a bunch of creatures out and your opponent has a bunch of creatures out and you need this. So... And plus, the rest of the card is obviously trash. Seven mana, five five flyer that gives them flying. Tilden Turner is just not even close to constructor playable, so I assume this guy's just poop. <laughs> uh, three mana, two one flying prowess next. <laughs> uh, ongoing investigation. So cool name, cool art. It kind of looks like a the art. Kind of looks like a like a professional painter like did it for a museum or something. I don't know. Um, so the one thing I want to note about this card, I don't think it's a great card. When one or more creatures steals combat damage to a player investigate, the thing I want to note here is that if you have a bunch of creatures coming in at once, like four creatures all get in, you only investigate one time. You get one clue token out of that. Now, if you get one creature in every single turn, you still get one clue token. So the goal with this is not to get through with a bunch of creatures all at once. The goal is to find a way to get a creature in every single turn while you have this out. Now, it's secondary ability, where you're exiling creature cards to gain two life. I don't know if that's good. I mean, you don't want to remove your delirium, obviously, for most, most purposes. Uh, you can't sacrifice clue tokens and then exile those. So the card kind of has this weird loopy clause. I mean, it's probably quite playable because it just does weird things. Like, if you're a blue-green deck and you need some life gain against the red deck, maybe you just turn to this because once it's out, you just, you know, scavenging who's your opponent to death. I don't, I don't know. This is, this is a really weird card if you, could, if you couldn't catch my vibe right now. Uh, I don't... It, it just does weird, weird stuff. Like, play this in mono-blue spirit or blue-white spirits, I guess, but then you don't get the second ability. Maybe it's good in Collected Company. I don't know. I don't know what, what this does. Just go play with it. Have fun. Maybe play it in limited. It's probably really good in limited. Go do that. Uh, figure out where you want to try the card. And then get back to me. We'll, we'll look at it later. It's a weird one. Uh, pieces of the puzzle. So we got Harrison Ford playing Jace here. Uh, crying, I think. I think those are tears. And there's uh, 
This is the wing of the Millennium Falcon. And then back here is, is uh, Sauron. Uh, and then over here is a cloud. So they reveal the Sapphire cards, your library, put up two in oh you oh this is actually a pretty legit card. So three mana, look at five cards, put the rest of them in your graveyard, I think is a playable text box without the middle part of like of what you're getting in there. You need to get at least one thing, of course. You need to get uh, a land, a creature, something. But as long as you get one thing to replace the card, the other four cards going in your graveyard is probably good enough in the new standard. Now this gets up to two instants or sorceries, which means this is a three mana draw two, where the two things are spells, like literally in this case, instants or sorceries, uh, and you're dumping other cards in the graveyard for delirium. You're actually dumping four cards in the graveyard for delirium. You could just get delirium off this because you dump three cards plus pieces of the puzzle. So if you discard another instant, a land, and a creature, bam, your delirium's on, and you just drew two. That is like an absurd amount of power for a random common to lose set. And Harrison Ford delivers. <laughs> he delivers in that regard. Uh, so I think this card is quite strong. I don't know where it goes. Obviously, it goes into some deck, like control deck or whatever. You need to be playing, I imagine, 30-ish instants and sorceries to really... To really make this work, um, I'm sure you can get away with it at like 20 or something, but you're you're just gonna miss at least one card too often there. But at 30, uh, this seems awesome. Obviously, it, it it hits itself, which is kind of degenerate to a certain degree. Like if I pieces the puzzle, it's a sorcery. Keep that in mind. So it's not just gonna like go into every single control deck, but it'll go into some tap out control decks. But if I pieces the puzzle for a wrath effect and another pieces of the puzzle, like that's just like. Ugh. Also keep in mind that grabbing counter spells with this is interesting, but it is not necessarily good. Like showing your opponent you have a counter spell is not necessarily what you want to be doing. That said, it also has some value in that, hey, maybe he just doesn't want to uh, cast any spells because I show them a counter spell. When in reality, that's your only counter spell, and now your opponent's like stalling for multiple turns when they could have just fought through the counter spell. So it's not like straight downside, but not great to grab counter spells with this most of the time. Uh, but yeah, I love this card. I don't know why, I just think it's just cool. We're just getting a lot of cool cards. Like this card, it's kind of cool. If it wasn't a sorcery, it would probably be... It'd probably, I would probably be mentioning it. But So we have... Draw three cards. So let's just go through the card. Five mana. Pour over the pages. Let's go through the pages. Draw three cards. Good. Untap up to two lands. Good. That reduces the casting cost list roughly to three. And then you discard a card. Bad, but uh, Madness and Delirium make it a little bit better. So in reality... If this were three mana, draw three, discard one, three mana sift, that card would be real good, I imagine. It's probably worse than this, but it seems like it would be real good. But this is not three mana sift, because you have to have five mana before you can cast it. So, and you have to expose it, so if you're in a counter war or whatever, you have to have five mana tapped when they go to counter it. I, I'm not a huge fan of this. I think you'd probably play the counter spell that investigates three times before you'd run this card. But it, it's certainly constructive label. I don't want to rule it out and like talk bad about it and you know get in a yo mama war or anything with pour over the pages. But it is uh, I don't know. It's interesting. It, it, I keep calling cards interesting. It, it, again, the cards are in the blue cards specifically. They just do really kind of weird things. Like this is just a weird card. Like we haven't had untapping lands in a long time. Uh, the drawing three, discarding one is very simple. But then you insert this untap two lands clause, and it's like. You know, where is this at? You don't want to value it at a 5 mana because it's unplayable there, but it's not really 5 mana. But then again, it's not really 3 mana. Calling it 4 mana is, you know, a lie, <laughs> always. So it's just a weird spot. If you want to look at it like 4 mana, if you want to base it off of the average cost or whatever and look at it 4 mana, then it is sift and it's not good enough. Uh, but at 3 mana, you know, maybe. Maybe. Uh... Ooh, the rattle chains. Old rattle chains. Where's rattle chains head at? Does anybody know? Is this what is this? Is this the head? See, like I see the two hands. I see like where the head should be. But then it's just like, is there no head there? Is the head is this the head? I don't know what's going on, man. I I this these arts throw me off too much. So rattle chains I wanted to mention because it is a uh, spirit for the spirit deck. <laughs> I already showed you the the spirits that uh, we that exist in in standard right now. I could actually just click. Uh, 
can I actually just do this? Because I don't think there's a lot in the two sets that are rotating. Maybe none. Oh, no, there is, because there's two mis- Oh, no, there wow. We're actually losing, like, ten spirits. But of the spirits that are remaining, uh, Anafens is a pretty solid one with Rattle Chains. Giving Anafens a Hexproof is just nice. You also get a plus one plus one counter on your Rattle Chains, making it a two mana three two Flash Flyer, which is pretty solid. Um, additionally, giving that's the only playable spirit, so uh, nothing else is exciting. But giving uh, other spirits like the two three that we talked about yesterday, um, what is his name? Bygone Bishop. Giving Bygone Bishop Shroud and or Hexproof, excuse me, and getting an Investigate token out of that exchange is like pretty awesome, I would say. You effectively are drawing a card and, and countering a removal spell, so it's, you know, two for zero, because you also get a 2-1 flyer out of the deal. So, like, spirits are, are potentially going to come in force. Uh, I, again, I would imagine this is not a deck that really pops up until we get the new set, but there might be enough spirits now, uh, and Rattle Change will certainly be at the forefront of that. I haven't even started talking about giving spirits flash. That text seems crazy good to me. So, like, if you think about Rattle Chains, if you just look at Rattle Chains, I think of fairies. I think of the fairy deck that existed in Standard back in the day because he just has so many similarities. He's, he's a, kind of a Spellstutter Sprite, kind of a Scion of Uno, where he like comes in, saves the spirit, or counters the spell for two mana. You get a relatively efficient body, a 2-1 Flash Flyer, that's good. And then you're giving your other spirits in your hand Flash, which now makes the rest of your deck operate like fairies, where you're just keeping open counter magic or whatever, and then at the end of your opponent's turn, flashing out a couple things. Like, that set of abilities seems really, really abusable. Uh, I don't know if there'll be enough spirits to support it right now, but I do think this card is strong. Pick four up. I think uh, it'll be worth it. They're going to be cheap, probably. Probably like a buck. That's your Wesco financial advice. Uh, Reckless Car, nothing to see here. He's reckless. What do we got left? We're almost done, right? Wow, wow. There's a lot. Alright. I guess I'm not going over all these. But, uh, Rise from the Tides is awesome, awesome, awesome limited card. Probably playable and constructed. Obviously, the the story here is pretty simple. You fill up your graveyard with instants and sorceries. You probably cast the three mana uh, pieces of the puzzle in this deck. Piece of the puzzle seems particularly strong. This might be a constructed playable deck. I mean, if you cast Rise from the Tides and you get uh, 10 2 2 zombies, which doesn't seem that difficult, that's crazy for 6 mana. You don't even exile this card, so this card then counts for your future Rise from the Tides. Obviously, your opponent can wrath it or whatever, but just being able to produce that many tokens for, for not that much mana uh, is pretty strong. Uh, the tokens coming in and play tap does mean this is not a very good card against aggro, but uh, Rise from the Tides plus Engulf the Shores. Already and plus uh, plus pieces of the puzzle. Like I'm already looking at a really kind of exciting near mono blue deck. Maybe we splash another color in there because we have some dual lands, uh, even four that are islands. But that I don't know. That deck's seeming cool to me already. So keep stuff like that in mind uh, because you can randomly surprise, especially at F and M level, uh, with that kind of deck. Two mana, one three, and there's a lot going on here. Still. Uh, <laughs> What is this card? Silver lined snapper. Silver. That's a Charlotte's Web. That's a Charlotte's Web reference for all you kiddos out there. Uh, this card's not playable. All right, that's been way too much time. Dancing scimitar, not playable, but it is a spirit. That's all I got. Sleep paralysis, not playable, but it is an aura, so you could tutor it up with open armory. That's all I got. Stitched mangler, not playable. No, this one actually is playable in kind of an awkward way. Uh, it's playable because it's a zombie, first and foremost, uh, but it also does lock down an opponent's creature for a turn. It taps it and locks it down for a turn, which is, you know, not the most thought-of constructed ability, but it can certainly be relevant, especially if you're taking advantage of the zombie creature type on this. Uh, it works with Eerie Interlude. It works with uh, the one-mana bounce spell we talked about. What's that card called? Let me look over here. Uh, Essence Flux. Works with Essence Flux which is also an Ezreal ability on League of Legends. That's why it was confusing. All right, Stitch Wing Scab. He looks like the dude from uh, Jeepers Creepers. St straight up. <laughs> straight up Jeepers Creepers guy here. I guess he, that makes sense because he's Stitch Wing. Yeah, that's kind of gross. Uh, 
He is three one fire for four. That's you know whatever. It's a, it's a playable body. Discarding two cards, return to the graveyard is obviously where all of the excitement lies here. Uh, that is, you know, if you compare this to the white card that I was excited about, uh, the white card was a three one life link. I don't remember the exact name, but you'll know from my description. It was a three one life link for four. Uh, Flying is probably better than life link, but you know both are really strongly constructed. And then you pay three mana and you got two one one flyers as a one time thing. Stitchwing scab, you have to pay a significantly higher cost to discard two cards, which is a lot, but you get a three one flyer. Uh, it comes into play tap, which is, you know, it probably didn't even need that clause because you're, you're paying so much to get it back. But 3-1 fire for 2 mana, an instant speed, and 2 cards. If you're madnessing those cards or you're doing something else with them, you know, this is this seems very playable to me. Uh, again, it's a niche card. It's not, I don't think Control Dexter is going to be running this to, like, you know, out-threat your opponent with infinite 3-1s. That just seems like not getting enough out of the deal, but... Beyond that, like this, this has reason to exist. It does things. Don't overlook these random uncommons that have powerful potential arch archetypes to be built around. Because oftentimes, like these, uh, the fact that these are uncommons and exist means that there are other things in the set that work well with it, which is why these are at uncommon to like make limited good. So if you spot these things early on in the uh, set's life, you get a lot of time to kind of you know piece together what this deck that might play Stitch Wing Scab might look like. And maybe there's only one deck that plays it, maybe there's two decks, and maybe they're both tier three decks, but, you know, there might be something there somewhere, so just keep that kind of stuff in mind. Uh, Storm Rider Spirit, nope. There's just so many 5 mana 3 2 flash fires these days. Alright, Trail of Evidence. You cast an instant or sorcery spell, investigate. Uh, this card could easily be good in that mono blue deck that I alluded to earlier. Um, I assume that it's not because... This is, you know, I mean, it's card advantage, just like really slow, grindy card advantage. But that said, this does make a ton of clues for uh, for fleeting memory, so we got that. I don't think this is good enough. That's one to keep in the keep in the books. I, I don't think I think investigation is so much worse than draw a card that you really can't afford to run. Maybe you can run a couple of this. I don't know. All right, vessel. It mills somebody, anybody for three, and you draw a card. Very, very playable and limited. You can turn on Delirium with this one card, including getting an enchantment in your graveyard. Uh, and in Constructed, I imagine this is fine. Three mana, mill three draw card is like, you know, not blowing my socks off, but, it, you know, if, there, if there's not enough mill cards to get your mill deck working, like, that, I guess, is fine. It's, it's enough. It's, again, Delirium enabling. It's going to be difficult to find enchantments you want to get in the graveyard in Constructed. This replaces itself, so it's, you know, it's kind of like a spell bomb, if you will. Like imagine this imagine this were a two mana spell bomb. Like you'd probably play this. One mana, mill three, draw cards, like fine. Like, I don't know. Seems fine. Nothing exciting, of course, but it does its job. Welcome to the fold is exciting, however, and it is our last blue card, which is awesome because bathroom break is necessary here in a second. Uh welcome to the fold. First of all, just look at that art. You're already you're already like yeah, what's going on here? Vampire cult stuff, creepiness. Uh, four mana. We steal a creature. Toughness two or less. Toughness. Blue cares about toughness these days. We're looking at all these cards. The the bounce spell, toughness, everything. So welcome the fold hits toughness, but it does work very well in this blue instant sorcery deck I'm talking about. Like we're by the end of this for the top eight thing, we're gonna have a sick little mono blue instant sorcery deck built. Just wait. Uh, but it works well with uh, with that because it is an instant of sorcery. It affects the board. It steals a creature, uh, etc. But then we get this madness trigger. This is a cycle of cards kind of that has this. Uh, we got this madness trigger that is X and then extends the ca the toughness of the creature up to X. So if you spend three mana on the madness, you can steal a toughness one or less. If you spend the casting cost of the card on the madness, you can get two or less. So you just get the same card at instant speed. Uh, and then if you add anything else on X, you can just get bigger guys, which is, you know, pretty strong. Uh, we haven't had many play... I mean, we haven't had very playable permanent uh, steel cards like this, uh, control magics like this. Most of the control magics are uh, are enchantment-based and can be killed, and then you get your creature back like illusory gains. So this card's certainly worth looking at. Uh, I imagine it'll be pretty popular and constructed, especially uh, in decks that can discard cards. But at the same time, you know, not every deck's going to want a control magic that steals small creatures, so it's not like it's going in every deck. But power levels here, uh, it's mostly just finding it at home. But that said, those are the end of the blue cards. We're going to move on to crazy black cards here in a second. 
Uh, I am Conley Woods. This is TCGPlayer.com. Taking a look at Shadows over Innistrad. Uh, mostly card by card, art by art, and uh, we haven't we haven't run into any stern stern creatures today, so that's good. We'll be we'll be back uh, here momentarily. Thanks for hanging out.